The sound cuts through your sleep at 3.17 a.m. It's the emergency alert system. That harsh, discordant buzz designed to trigger immediate anxiety. You fumble for your phone, expecting a flash flood warning or a severe thunderstorm watch. You don't get that. The screen flashes red with a classification you've never seen in any FEMA handbook. Biological threat. Level zero. The glass of your bedroom window starts vibrating. It's not the rattle of a passing truck. It's a constant constant, low-frequency hum that you feel in your teeth. You stumble to the window. Outside, the bay is wrong. The water isn't just low. It's receding at a speed that defies tidal charts, sucked out toward the horizon as the ocean itself is taking a deep breath. Then you hear the boom. It isn't thunder. It's a footstep. You aren't watching a movie. You are ground zero for an event that biology says shouldn't exist. The Displacement Event Let's break down the physics of what happens when a 99,000 ton organism makes landfall. In the movies, the monster rises from the depths and the water cascades off its scales like a majestic waterfall. The reality is much uglier. It's called fluid displacement. When an object with the mass of an aircraft carrier and the volume of a skyscraper enters a shallow bay, that water has to go somewhere. Archimedes' principle dictates that the water is pushed forward in a hydraulic surge before the creature even breaches the surface. You grab your go bag, heart hammering against your ribs, but before you reach the door, the street lights outside explode. They don't flicker, they pop in unison. The surge has forced millions of gallons of seawater into the city's drainage outflows. The pressure shoots manhole covers 50 feet into the air like cast iron frisbees. The water floods the subway tunnels instantly, shorten out the high voltage third rails. The ground isn't just shaking, it's liquefying. The specific seismic frequency of a 99,000 ton footfall turns loose soil into quicksand destabilizing the foundations of the substation down the block. The grid protects itself the only way it knows how. A hard shutdown. Your apartment plunges into darkness. You're moving now, taking the stairs two at a time because the elevators are death traps. Your brain is trying to rationalize the impossible. You know the science. You know the square cube law. It states that as an organism grows in size, its volume cubes while its surface area only squares. If you double an animal's size, its strength roughly quadruples, but its weight multiplies by eight. A creature this size shouldn't be able to stand. Its bones would snap under the crushing weight of its own mass. Its heart would need to pump blood at pressures that would rupture its arteries. Thermodynamics says it should cook itself alive from the inside out because it can't shed its body heat fast enough. But as you kick open the lobby door and spill out onto the street, the laws of physics seems to have been suspended. The air smells of ozone, sulfur, and stagnant swamp muck. You look up past the panicked commuters freezing in the middle of the intersection, past the flickering billboards. You see the dorsal plates. They cut the skyline like jagged shards of charcoal, glowing with a faint, sickly blue luminescence. You try to gauge the scale. The creature stands 120 meters tall, taller than a Statue of Liberty, dwarfing the office buildings around it. Seeing something that large moving with biological fluidity triggers a primal lizard brain vertigo. It's not just fear. It's a complete rejection of your reality. Evolution did not prepare your brain to process a predator the size of a mountain range. The creature stops. It hasn't seen you. You are less than an ant to it, but it prepares to announce its arrival. The air pressure around you drops suddenly, painfully popping your eardrums. The water was the warning. The displacement was the shove. But the atmospheric compression building in the creature's throat right now, that is the weapon. Gridlock and the Stampede You reach the main avenue and the illusion of escape evaporates. You are now witnessing the immediate failure of modern urban planning. Civil engineers designed highway infrastructure to handle peak rush hour traffic, which usually accounts for about 10% of a city's population moving in various directions. They do not design for 100% of the population moving in a single direction simultaneously. The result is total gridlock. 
The highways aren't roads anymore. They're parking lots of steel and combustion engines. You weave between the stalled cars, the air thick with exhaust and the rising panic of drivers realizing they're trapped in their own vehicles. Through an open car window, you hear the emergency broadcast crackling over a radio. The announcer's voice is trembling. He isn't talking about just one creature. He's listing cities. London, Munich, San Francisco. This isn't an isolated biological anomaly. It is a mass awakening. The Titan variable has just entered the equation. You aren't dealing with a single animal invading a territory. You are dealing with a global ecosystem reset. The realization hits the crowd like a physical blow. There is nowhere to run because the safe zones are gone. You abandon the idea of a vehicle. You run. This is where the psychology of the herd takes over. In a high-stress environment, individual decision-making shuts down, replaced by a collective hive mind driven by contagion. You run because the person next to you is running. If they scream, your amygdala interprets that as an immediate threat. Flooding your system with cortisol before you even see what they're screaming at, you try to check your phone for a map for a message from family, for anything. It's a brick. The screen shows network busy or simply SOS. It's not that the towers are down yet, it's that the bandwidth is saturated. Cellular networks use a system called access class barring during emergencies to prioritize first responders. But when two million people try to live stream their own deaths or call their mothers simultaneously, the switches physically cannot route the packets. The digital infrastructure collapses just as fast is the traffic grid. Emergency services are non-existent. You pass an ambulance trapped in the gridlock. It's lights spinning uselessly. The paramedics are gone. They joined the stampede. Then, the atmospheric compression you felt earlier releases. The creature roars. This isn't a movie sound effect mixed for a comfortable theater experience. This is a biological acoustic weapon. The sound pressure levels hits 174 decibels. For context, a jet engine taken off is 140 decibels. The threshold for immediate permanent hearing loss is around 160. At 174 decibels, sound stops being just noise and becomes a physical shockwave. The air molecules are compressed so tightly they form a solid wall of force. Your hands fly to your ears, but it doesn't matter. Your eardrums rupture instantly. A sharp, hot pain followed by a terrifying reduction of the world into muffled underwater thuds. But the biological damage is secondary to the structural damage. The resonant frequency of the roar hits the skyscrapers lining the avenue. The tempered glass of 10,000 office windows flexes, bows, and then shatters simultaneously. It rains shards. The sky above the city turns into a glittering curtain of death. Massive sheets of plate glass, heavy enough to decapitate, slam into the pavement and the stalled cars. The street level becomes a kill box of shrapnel. You dive under a delivery truck, curling into a ball as the city destroys itself around you. The roar fades, leaving a ringing silence in your broken ears. But the vibration in the pavement changes. It's not the rhythmic thud of the creature anymore. It's a high-pitched mechanical scream approaching from the south. The crowd stops moving, looking up through the falling dust as a squadron of F-22 Raptors breaks the sound barrier directly overhead. Collateral damage. The missiles strike. In a summer blockbuster, this is the moment the music swells, the smoke clears, and the beast roars in pain. In physics, however, this is simply a math error. The F-22s unleash a payload of AIM-9 Sidewinders and 20mm Vulcan cannon fire, but they're trying to pierce a biological composite that evolution, or whatever nightmare science created this, designed to withstand pressures at the bottom of the Mariana Trench. Godzilla's hide isn't just skin. It is a lattice of osteoderms, bone-like scales denser than depleted uranium. 
The missiles detonate on contact, but the kinetic energy doesn't penetrate. It disperses. The creature doesn't even flinch. It just turns. And that turn is more dangerous than the missiles. Godzilla's tail, a massive counterweight of muscle and bone, whips around to stabilize its footing. It clips the side of a 40-story office tower. The building doesn't crumble cinematically. It shears. Thousands of tons of steel and concrete are suddenly airborne, converting potential energy into kinetic energy. When a titan fights, the city becomes a weapon against you. That falling debris isn't just rubble. There are kinetic missiles the size of delivery vans raining down at terminal velocity. You scramble down the concrete steps of the nearest subway station, not because it's safe, but because the sky is falling. You huddle against the tile wall near the turnstiles, gasping for air that is now thick with pulverized drywall and asbestos. But the ground beneath you feels wrong. It's soft. This is earthquake liquefaction. The sheer violence of the Godzilla's movements is vibrating the water-saturated soil of the city so intensely that the solid ground is behaving like a liquid. The soil particles lose contact with each other. The subway station isn't just shaking, it's floating in a sea of mud. The walls groan as the structural integrity of the tunnel fights the crushing pressure of the earth itself. You realize that if the ceiling gives, you're buried in a tomb of concrete and slurry. Then the shaking stops. The air pressure changes again, but this time the atmosphere feels electrically charged. The hair on your arms stand up. You taste metal, a sharp, bitter tang of copper on your tongue. The darkness of the tunnel is suddenly illuminated by a blinding, pulsating blue light pouring down from the street entrance. It's the atomic breath. Pop culture depicts this as a laser beam or a stream of fire. Science calls it a superheated ionization event. The creature is expelling a concentrated stream of radioactive plasma. The thermal radiation radius is absolute. Anything within one kilometer of that beam isn't just burned, it's instantly vaporized as the water molecules in its structure flash boil into steam. You are outside the evaporation zone, but you cannot escape the thermal pulse. Even five miles away from the point of impact, the ambient temperature spikes within seconds. It's not a gradual warning. It is a heat hammer. The air in the subway tunnel jumps to 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Outside, the paint on cars is blistering. Tires are melting into the asphalt. Everything flammable, curtains, trash, dry leaves, spontaneously combusts without a spark. This is the reality of the survivor narrative versus the hero narrative. In the movies, the protagonist stands on a rooftop watching the titans clash, wind blowing through their hair. In reality, you are curled into a fetal ball in a dark, sweltering hole pressing your hands over your bleeding ears, praying you don't boil alive. You don't watch the fight. You survive the shock waves. And then, as quickly as it started, the chaos ends. The ground stops liquefying. The heat lingers, suffocating and heavy, but the rhythmic thud of the footsteps fades into the distance. The mechanical scream of the jets is gone. The roar is gone. The sound of battle are replaced by something far worse. A heavy, suffocating silence. The invisible fallout. You wait hours before moving. When you finally crawl up the twisted metal of the subway stairs, shielding your eyes from a sun that feels too bright, you aren't stepping back into your city. You are stepping onto the surface of a different planet. The skyline's jagged, toothless where the skyscrapers used to be. But the destruction isn't the primary threat anymore. The monster's gone, but it left something behind. The air glitters. It's a beautiful, terrifying dust settling over the ruins. A gray snow in the middle of summer. This isn't just ash from fires. It is a highly radioactive particulate matter. In the movies, the credits roll after the monster retreats to the ocean. In reality, this is where the dying truly begins. You are now walking through a Cherenkov field. The residual ionization from the atomic breath has excited the particles in the air, creating a faint, ghostly blue luminescence that clings to the debris. It looks magical 
magical. It is actually a death sentence. You pull your shirt over your mouth, but standard cotton weaves can't filter alpha particles, let alone the gamma radiation bathing the street. You are already accumulating a dosage that will lead to acute radiation syndrome. ARS. The symptoms won't start for a few hours. Nausea first, then the headaches, then the cellular breakdown. But the DNA damage is already done. The isotope half-lives means this city won't be habitable for 10,000 years. You look up at the clouds, they are darkening, swirling with unnatural speed. This is the Godzilla trace. The immense thermal energy released during the battle has punched a hole in the local atmosphere, disrupting the troposphere and creating a localized supercell. The radioactive isotopes lofted into the stratosphere are condensing. It's about to rain, and this rain won't wash the city clean. It'll coat everything. The soil, the reservoirs, the crops, and a layer of strontium-90 and cesium-137. You realize, standing there in the heavy silence, that the immediate danger wasn't the footsteps. It's what comes next. The Titans are aquatic. They travel via the oceans. That means they surface at coastlines. Look at a map of global trade. Los Angeles, Shanghai, Tokyo, Rotterdam. The hubs of the global supply chain are all coastal. If Godzilla destroys the ports, the world doesn't just lose consumer electronics, it loses the ability to move grain, oil, and antibiotics. The grocery stores won't be restocked next week or next month. The intricate web of logistics that keeps 8 billion people alive has just been severed. The insulin in the pharmacy, the fuel for the generators, the parts to fix the grid, it's all gone. This is the true horror of the Godzilla era. It's not the fight, it's the ecological displacement. Humanity has spent 10,000 years climbing to the top of the food chain, convincing ourselves we tamed nature. That illusion is gone. We are no longer the apex predators. We are effectively ants living in a construction zone, hoping the heavy machinery doesn't notice us. You didn't escape the city to return to your old life. That life is extinct. You survived the event, but now you have to survive the ecosystem that replaced it. The final image of this story isn't a triumphant rebuild. It's you, huddled in a basement three weeks later, holding a Geiger counter to a bottle of rainwater before you dare to take a sip. The click, click, click of the meter is the new soundtrack of your life. The movies show us victory. Science dictates permanent displacement. If you want to see how long humanity lasts when King Kong enters the equation, like and subscribe for the next breakdown.